So I want to change the world, and I'm going to tell you three stories that are seemingly unrelated, but I'm going to tie them together. This is John. He's 46, works at a fast food restaurant. He's got three kids. He had an injury a number of years ago, lost an eye. He had to get a lot of medication after the surgery, and he didn't actually use all that medication. He had a friend, this friend who was on even harder times than him. Even with all of John's responsibilities, he decided to lend his friend some money. One day, that friend came to him and said that he was in a lot of pain. He had something bad going on, physical pain. So John gave him some of his meds. It happened to be the same day that his friend was paying him back for the loan. Well, that friend wasn't really a friend. That friend was actually a police informant who had this deal with the police that if he got some other people in jail, then he wouldn't have to go to jail. It's like the, the darkest pyramid scheme you could ever imagine. But that goes on in this country. Well, John here got the minimum, mandatory minimum, 25 years in prison for helping out his friend. And these are his kids. He won't see them for 25 years. And when he gets out, he still will have only one eye and probably no marketable skills. Next story. This is the sea urchin, green sea urchin. Strongylus centrotus drobachiensis. We have these in the Gulf of Maine. And this is a fishery. We've been fishing these since 1985. We get millions of dollars in some of the poorest regions in Maine. It's been a good industry at first, and now it's really bad. There are so few urchins in the southern half of the Gulf of Maine, they had to lower the fishing season again and again. See, the, it was a boom and bust cycle, and it hit the bust in the mid-90s after only 10 years in a panic. Regulators started to shorten the fishing season and tighten limits but it didn't work. They didn't come back. Even during the time when they only had 10 days of fishing per year, the urchins just did not come back. What's going on? Now, human language. This is one of my favorite subjects ever. What is language? Now, I'm a computer scientist, and we think we know what language is. We define it using symbols. Like, let's say you have a set of words, a finite set of words and you have a grammar. The grammar tells you how to put those words together, what combinations constitute a legal sentence and what is not legal, or what is in the language and what is not in the language. And it's a perfectly well-defined set. Richelieu, in 1635, founded l'Académie Française that tells you what is French and what is not. This is one of the big efforts out there to in a sense, restrict language. They're the ones who say that you can't say email. Email is not a French word. You have to say courrier électronique. But who's going to say that? Email is so much easier to say. And language is always changing. New words come out all the time. Cryptocurrency, you may have heard that. Proganjavist. If you think about it, you can, you can get the definitions pretty easily for these. Rutitude. Dudevorce. Sapiosexual. There's so many new words coming out all the time, it's easy to get an asterism just trying to keep up with them all. What about grammar? Even grammar can change. Now, when you see this joke enough, it almost starts to feel like it's not a joke. It starts to feel like, okay, maybe that is actually grammatically correct. I've heard it come up in conversations before. So if vocabulary and grammar is so diverse amongst us, what is English, this language that we think we all speak? Are there two people in this room who know the same set of words with the same definitions? No. We can't even find an English for just this room. And if diversity of language isn't enough of a problem, let's talk about ambiguity. This is Derek, Derek Bentley. In 1952, he was hanging out with a troublemaker friend of his. His friend had a gun. They were confronted by a cop. The cop said, let me have the gun or hand it to me. And Derek shouted at his friend, let him have it. His friend shot the cop. 
Derek was arrested and charged with accessory to murder. At less than two months later, he was hanged. Justice systems were pretty quick back then. What did he mean? Let him have the gun or let him have a bullet? Ambiguity cost him his life. Language is hard even for us, even for us humans. If language is hard for humans, how in the world is a computer going to handle it? And if you've ever used Google Translate, you know what I'm talking about. So let's recap. John Horner is sitting in jail. Sea urchins are dying off. And Google Translate doesn't work. So I'm going to tie these all together with these guys. These are starlings. Starlings are amazing birds. Now, all birds have instincts, but their instincts are specially tuned after millions of years of evolution to work together in an amazing way. You see, there's three instincts in particular that are very important. One is point relatively the same direction as your nearest neighbors. Don't stray too far from the group. And don't get too close to any single individual. When you put all these birds together in a large enough group, you get beautiful patterns like this just emerge. And we've done this in computer simulations. It emerges from those three rules. Amazing patterns that make them less susceptible to predation. It's maybe because a falcon can't get a beat on any single individual. This is not the same. There's a lot going on here, but this I call complicated. This isn't complex. This is complicated. There's a very important distinction here. Complexity is when you have a system of elements and each one on its own, you can understand it. And it has interactions, local interactions with others, but they're all doing this. And when you get enough of them together, patterns emerge. This complexity science gives us a new way to look at the world. It's a paradigm. It's a new way to think about things. When you can think about things in a new way, maybe you can find new solutions. The special thing we have now with supercomputers and modern techniques, we can finally model complex systems. Think about the structure of things. An anthill, for instance. Let's say right here I've got an anthill. It's got a million ants in it. They're all walking around leaving pheromone trails, and they use pheromones to communicate with each other. It's an asynchronous method of communication by which they coordinate their efforts for taking care of the young, fighting wars, constructing new tunnels. They, it's like leaving text messages everywhere. This is what I'm working on. This is what I'm working on. And the next ant comes along and finds it. Well, let's say I dig a hole right here, and in this hole, I dump a pile of a million ants. These two are not the same, not even remotely the same, but that's how we treat urchins. You see, what an anthill is to ants, a barren is to urchins. Now, an urchin barren is much simpler, but it's an area where a bunch of urchins have mowed down the seaweed, and they keep it down. The larger urchins do the most eating. We come along, we humans, and we take only the larger urchins. The smaller urchins, we leave them behind, and we pat ourselves on the back for, oh, we're leaving some behind. Isn't that nice? But they can't keep the seaweed down. Within one or two years, the seaweed grows back, and you see these small urchins, they have predators like the Jonah crab. Those predators like the safety of seaweed. They don't like being out in the open. The urchin barren was uh, like a safe zone for them. So now they've come back in. The smaller ones are doomed. So we, yes, we leave the smaller urchins behind, but we're signing their death warrants when we take away the mature ones. The structure. But why don't we model this now? Well, we do model this because the professor that I work for, he got me to build this computer model of a sea urchin ecology. Green is the seaweed, red are sea urchins, white is land, and the gray is water. And through using this model, I've tested a bunch of different harvesting techniques, and I've come up with some that I believe are actually sustainable. In the past, we've only modeled urchins with an equation, a number of equations, and people use population equations all the time, but the salient feature from these equations is how many of them there are. 
but how many is like looking at the urchins like a big pile of ants. A big pile of ants is not the same as an anthill. So I want people to look at sea urchin ecologies and other ecologies as systems. The reason we had to use population equations in the past because we didn't have the modern tools we have now. What about humans? Do we have rules? When I was telling you the, the rules for the birds, did that remind you of anything about us? We, are we looking to each other to see if we're pointed in the same direction? Do we try to stray not too far from the group? Well, think about baboons and other primates. There was a British anthropologist, Robin Dunbar, a number of years ago, who charted neocortex size against group size. And there's actually a pretty nice line. The larger the neocortex is on a primate, the larger the group can get. Now for humans, it's about 150. But 7.1 billion is a lot bigger than a group of 150. Well, how do we handle it? We have coping mechanisms. We have to cope with the fact that we literally cannot treat each person as an individual. And what are our coping mechanisms? Racism, nepotism, all kinds of other surface features. We look at someone, we ask them what they do, where are they from, how do they speak. And we use these surface features to judge people and label them and put them in boxes. So maybe if discrimination and a lot of these problems are just a coping mechanism for dealing with the fact that we're in a system that's too large, just knowing that can lead us to better solutions. We have to understand the system that we're in. Let's say you're a legislator and you're troubled by the drug epidemic in this country. What do you do about it? Well, if you're a legislator, you can really only do one thing, make new rules. You're a rule maker. So let's make a rule that's gonna change the incentives and make it really a bad idea for people to get into drug dealing. I know. Mandatory minimum sentences of 25 years. Well, we know how that turns out. See, complexity science just gives us a new lens to look at the world through. When you have a more accurate view of the world, you can do so much more. Forget language as we knew it. We know that language is not this one thing that we all have. What if instead of looking at the things we say, let's look at the people Forget the language and focus on the people. What's going on in your head when you want to talk to someone? You have a complex, multidimensional idea in your head, and you're trying to get into someone else's head. You compress it into a one-dimensional time series, sound waves, and then those get uncompressed in the other person's head using their linguistic knowledge and using their human experience as signposts. It's actually an amazing feat. Now, there's also a game theory aspect to it. You have trade-offs. You can either be very concise or very precise. But to be very precise, sometimes it takes a long time. You have to say things in a very long, convoluted way, and the person listening to you might fall asleep. Or maybe you want to talk to them, but you don't want to communicate perfectly. Maybe you want ambiguity. But there's this huge range of things you might want to do. It's a game. It's like a communication game. So what is language as we know it then? Language is merely this ephemeral auditory byproduct of the human communication game. And when you see it like that, maybe that would totally change our strategies for translation, for automatic translation. And when you have computers that can actually automatically translate anything you write, you could actually be Facebook friends with people that you've never met in other countries that don't speak your language. And I personally don't want to go to war against any of my Facebook friends. If you were going to war as a country and you literally had a few hundred friends in the country you're going to go to war against and everybody was like that, there would be much more anger about war. There'd be much more of a desire to not fight wars. So everything we've been doing for the last few thousand years, mathematics, philosophy, science, medicine, 
biology, all these things, they're kind of like the analogy between the single equation, the population equation, and modeling a system in all of its complexity. All this stuff we've been doing for the last few thousand years is the easy stuff. It's time to human up and really take on some bigger challenges. This, would, this could change everything we think about economics. Economics, for instance, is all about equilibrium. But most systems we live in are far from equilibrium. They're very different. So, just to wrap it up, complexity is going to change all of our lives. Stephen Hawking said this century is the century of complexity science. And we have to understand these systems that we're in because a system, most systems were devised to serve the people in them. But in the end, people serve it. Or like I like to say, we run things. Things don't run we. Thank you. <laughs>